Okay, I've got, uh, I'll jump into the slides here. So uh, the exercise was uh, in May. And uh, so first off, thank you to everybody who helped. We had uh, 50 Aries volunteers who took time off in the middle of the work week, uh, took time off from work or their uh, retirement chores or travels or medical appointments in order to carve space out to participate for a half day. So thank you to everybody that did that. Uh, thank you also to the voice repeater owners uh, who made sure that their machines were up and ready for us on the date of the exercise. A uh, thank you to the VARA uh, repeater owners, uh, N2DDS, XT2BC, K6AQA5T, who uh, operate and manage those uh, VARA repeaters, which uh, made life very easy for us during the exercise. Uh, thanks for uh, K6AQ uh, weekly wind link drills, keeping us on our toes. Thanks to the net controls and the MOC operators during the exercise who made things uh, happen very smoothly. And also thank you to the one solo operator. We had one solo operator the way it turned out this time. Uh, Mark Williams uh, down in South Bay was a solo operator at one hospital. So thank you for uh, everything, everyone that you did to make that happen. So a quick summary, uh, we covered 15 hospitals. We also covered the MOC and we had uh, six communications hubs uh, relaying traffic around. Uh, as mentioned, 50 volunteers. Uh, Aries assignments were fluid. They were changing right up to the last minute of the exercise. The hospitals list kept changing, hospitals in, hospitals out. We ran an HF regional net overlay on top of our local county exercise. We also had a regional HF net happening. Thank you to everybody who helped out with that. Uh, we passed uh, over 200 WinLink messages. Looking at the 309s, there were over 200 uh, WinLink messages, uh, including position reporting. Uh, that happened. Dozens of voice messages going flying around. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we did simplex in addition to 15 repeaters, and the uh, it was uh, from eight o'clock in the morning to to noon. Uh, four hours of fun, I like to say. So just to recap, we had uh, four or five written plans. Five written plans that came out. It was a comp plan, which listed the 15 repeaters. We had voice injects, uh, wind link injects and hospital etiquette uh, email that came out in the assignments list. The injects are something that we do uh, in order to make sure that we are, are on our toes. We know that sometimes the hospitals underemploy us. Uh, we arrive at the, uh, the site and we, uh, worst case scenario, I've had the experience. You may have also had the experience of going to uh, a hospital, setting up, uh, sitting in the parking lot, uh, ready to do something, but nothing happens for three hours and you pack up and go home. That's the worst situation you can possibly have. So we want to uh, engage ourselves and engage the hospitals. And so we have the voice injects and the wind leak injects to demonstrate uh, all of our capabilities. Uh, so the pre-exercise planning was, uh, was good. Uh, the uh, section manager, SCC, Bruce, thank you, attend planning meetings a year round, making sure that uh, Aries is on their radar. Uh, Aries was included in the, uh, the county's master scenarios uh, events list, the measles. And so that's, that's wonderful because if, it's, if we're in the measles, that means that uh, we're going to have to do something officially during the exercise. And location leaders, I know it was not easy. The advanced liaison, people didn't return your calls, your, your emails, uh, new hospital staff, people on vacation. They're not in charge of that anymore. So-and-so got promoted. We don't know who's going to cover the location. It was very, very difficult. So uh, thank you for persevering uh, all the location leaders in order to uh, conduct that liaison and uh, uh, know to where to set up and when to set up and, and who you're going to be talking to uh, during the exercise. Uh, the after action reports uh, that came in, some comments, uh, people talked about a variety of uh, power sources they used, whether it was a shore commercial power or battery sources. Uh, the pros and cons of headsets uh, were discussed. Uh, most people like headsets to uh, cut down on exterior noise, and, and so they're not disturbing other people. A lot of discussion in after action reports on using HTs uh, versus uh, the mobile rig. Uh, GIS mapping, uh, we submitted uh, the latitude, longitude, GPS coordinates to uh, the MOC, so mapping worked well. Uh, there are some people say we need more wind link practice, so we're going to uh, look for ways in the future before an exercise to conduct more wind link practice. And uh, uh, there was a request for more 213 of uh, voice practice. So if you've never seen a 213 before, it's like, what do I do? It's just one big sheet of paper. And so 
the protocol of sending people uh, have requested more voice practice on 213s. Uh, there was a nice uh, uh, semi-humorous comment that somebody uh, uh, using waterproof paper found out that the waterproof paper and the printer does not always get along with the inkjet ink. So a little lesson learned there for people. Waterproof paper, very good, very expensive, but does not mix well, well with uh, inkjet ink. Uh, a lot of discussion also about the hospital status report forms, uh, variations of the formats and the titles, uh, the one used by hospitals, the one in WebAOC, the one in the WinLink uh, software. Uh, we're gonna try to synchronize all these forms and, and try to get everybody as close as possible to using the same form. Uh, uh, an attainable goal, I hope. Uh, I know that uh, the ones, the form used by hospitals are not numbered fields. We'd like to use numbered fields. So uh, we're, we're hoping to work that out in the future. Uh, continuing with the after action report uh, comments, there's a request that uh, uh, there be a five minute warning uh, before net call, net roll calls happen. Uh, I thought I heard some uh, five minute warnings. I, I don't remember if that was for all the net roll calls at the top of the hour, if they gave the five minute warning or not. So I request to, the people to do that, please. Uh, and, and we note that checking out of a net is not always possible because you'll be sitting at your Aries station doing your radio stuff. And all of a sudden a delegation of VIPs, the, uh, your hospital incident commander and a bunch of other guests and visitors suddenly there they are in front of you and you stand up and greet them and welcome them and you're talking to them and there was just not that opportunity uh, to check out of the net. Uh, Comments in the after action reports about the ham radios and antennas that are installed in hospitals are often in degraded condition. The antennas might be bad, uh, waterlogged, uh, coax, uh, not always the best. So conditions of, and, and equipment unfamiliar to people, uh, you know, if they've never pushed the buttons on a Kenwood before and all of a sudden, uh, boom, that's the one that's in the hospital. You know, what do I do? How do I operate it? So there was a learning curve at some locations. Uh, the standard repeater, uh, uh, I understand that the uh, sharp hospitals called dibs uh, during the, the exercise on the uh, sharp uh, Kearney Mesa Sandra repeater. And so if that's going to be the situation of the future, we can discuss that and we'll just mark it in the comm plan as uh, uh, sharp hospitals will be using that standard repeater for sharp to sharp uh, communications. Uh, some people mentioned that uh, the optimum number of uh, channels to be listening to was three primary repeater, uh, listen to an alternate uh, repeater, and also the wind link. So you're going to have, uh, in uh, some cases, three frequencies are going. If you're in a fully staffed uh, Aries uh, station, uh, you would have three repeaters going. Uh, often new setups at locations and hospitals. Uh, if you've operated at different hospitals over the years, you know that uh, from time to time, they say, oh, new location for you, new location for the hospital command center. From now on, we're going to be operating from here. So it's always a learning curve uh, when there's a new setup location. Uh, one hospital reported a good antenna location on the eighth floor terrace of the hospital. It's like, wow, that's a lot of elevation. Good antenna placement. And they were able to do, uh, that was uh, Palomar Hospital, and they were able to do some great simplex uh, from there. Also, uh, overall, uh, all locations reported good interaction uh, with hospital staff and also hospitals talking, planning about the future with Aries and uh, future training, uh, future equipment, and future involvement in hospital activities. Uh, so overall positives, the voice traffic, net controls, uh, well done to everybody. Winlink, a uh, hero as usual. Uh, backup repeaters for voice traffic, great to have the depth of repeaters there. The, uh, the 213s and the 309s and the 214s and the after action reports uh, were great. Uh, opportunities for improvement. Uh, we've been trying to do the uh, MOC sit rep during every exercise and it's flopped for several years since we started to try this. And there may be an information gap at the MOC. The uh, ARIES team at the MOC may not be in the best 
position to be receiving information from the AMOC staff on what's happening out there throughout the county. So we're going to look at different ways to get an AMOC sit rep bulletin or some kind of information bulletin uh, sent out, maybe gleaned from other sources, maybe an ARIES member uh, with a web EOC login or monitoring social media uh, offsite will be able to uh, put everything into a bulletin and we'll take that burden off the MOC ARIES people and put that on somebody sitting at home and they can put together a bulletin with information gleaned from other sources and send that out so that uh, everybody, those of us in the field operating at hospitals can get a, a quick summary of what's happening uh, throughout the county and then pass on that same information to our uh, incident commander at our hospital saying, this is what's happening throughout the county. So they also have the situational awareness of, of what's happening. Uh, remember a few years ago, we had the combined law enforcement medical exercise uh, where we had uh, simultaneous uh, explosions simulated at uh, two different uh, locations in the county, North County, South County, and keeping track of how many incidents there were and who was on lockdown and who was not and what was going on. Uh, a, a lot of confusion during the exercise, uh, point out the need for having this kind of sit rep happen. Uh, other uh, things discussed uh, in the after action reports and, and overall were the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of operating inside the hospital versus outside the hospital. And uh, post ex reporting, my apologies, uh, some confusion uh, in the days after the exercise, uh, we were receiving 214s, 214As, uh, 309s and after action reports and uh, were they supposed to be sent via WinLink or email? And were you supposed to send those to uh, K6R, GF, AFC, GM, K6AQ, or Groups IO, or somebody else? A lot of confusion of all those combinations there. Who was supposed to be getting what? And so uh, thank you for your patience in working through that. We'll try to clarify that uh, next time around of who gets which report so that you only have to send it once and not repeatedly. And you know, I, I thought I sent that, didn't you get it? Uh, that kind of confusion. And we'll also work, as mentioned, the on the hospital status report of the form variations. Uh, just a, a quick note here, the, here's a sample 214 that was turned in from one location. A handwritten 214 is fine. Uh, it can be you know, just who was there, uh, start and finish times are important. We use these for time tracking to say that we participated this many uh, man hours uh, were uh, devoted to the exercise uh, during execution or planning. And, and it's, so we try to keep it very simple. And uh, 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 for your future reference, a uh, handwritten 214 like that, send a photo. Uh, that's fine. That, that covers all the bases we need. Now, picture time, picture time. On the 214s? Yes, yes. Um, from another context, uh, uh, Judy and NJLS is brief that. Uh, uh, 214s are important to demonstrate, you know, kind of what happened when she uh, she told us as uh, KCS when she was on uh, animal rescue uh, uh, duty. It was important to to note, you know, when you uh, came, when you left one place and arrived the other place, you know, when you were in or out, when you were there, uh, maybe what you did there. So, um, you know, basically, I, I on my 214s, whenever I went off the air, I told net control and logged that I was off the air. So. You know that's a, a significant event uh, in that your capability is uh, is changed. So that sort of thing is is what I was kind of looking for for two fourteen reporting. You know when did you arrive? When did you leave? Uh, and and such. So I was doing and who the was there? Tracking. Yeah, and who was there? I was doing the time time tracking based on those. So that was uh, it was a big big number this this month on on uh, last month on time. It's you know, like five hundred hours or something. So. Uh, the hospital drill was about 480 of that. So uh, good job, all. Thank you for the reporting and uh, thank you for the input. Back to you. Okay, great comments. Thank you. So picture time. So here's uh, Chris and Bill at Sharp Memorial Hospital. You can see that they were setting up in a patio location at uh, Sharp Memorial Hospital in Kearney Mesa. Uh, so there are radios in front of them and uh, smiling faces, uh, probably talking to hospital staff as they're walking by. Uh, Kevin, KK6FRK at Radio Children's, obviously set up in the parking lot at uh, Radio Children's. Uh, they had a reserved parking spots in a row uh, for Aries and set up the Aries station uh, there in the parking lot at uh, Radio Children's. Here's Tim at uh, Naval Medical Center San Diego, Balboa. Uh, we always set up on uh, is a very busy sidewalk. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a training command school university operating uh, right next to us 
the uh, hospital command centers in the basement. So we set up in a uh, just off a busy sidewalk uh, so we don't get stepped on and uh, very comfortable there, shaded. And uh, the only disadvantage of that, of course, is we're in the approach to Lindbergh Field. And so every so often, uh, all the the, uh, the den jet engines overhead are drowning out uh, everything that we could possibly hear from the radio. Uh, Ted and Tom at Sharp Grossmont uh, uh, set up inside, uh, dealing with uh, coax connections uh, through uh, the bulkheads and in walls and, and, and changing locations and arrangements at uh, Sharp Grossmont. So uh, that's Ted and Tom. Uh, there's Gary and Mike set up in the uh, Valley Center trailer. Uh, which was uh, moved to PMC uh, Escondido, the hospital formerly known as Palomar Hospital, now PMC Escondido, uh, set up in the parking lot at, uh, at PMC Escondido, Gary and Mike. Uh, at the MOC, there's Frank, and be one said, at, at the MOC, set up in his uh, mobile command post uh, radio communications vehicle uh, conducting wind link uh, from the MOC. And Bruce, I'm out of words and slides. Uh, back to you, and I will uh, stop my screen share. Very good, thanks, Rob. So initially, the um, well, let me step. Let me step through what Rob was discussing. There were um, situational awareness challenges throughout the event. I know that there's always been a strong desire to have folks that are working at the MOC relay current status on what's happening within the exercise itself from the MOC to all units and all stations. We have tried to do that in the past and to be candid, I think we've run into the, the obvious problem in that time is artificial in the event. There are certain groups hospital-wise, even within a system that may operate without some of the tracking and time boundaries that are imparted or imposed within the schedule of events. So if you're tracking what's happening at the MOC, they're kind of in the same boat that we all are as well. They're sitting there waiting for status reports and updates from the hospitals, from the sites, from the facilities. And they're hoping that they will at least loosely track to the actual schedule of events that are supposed to unfold from a time perspective. So just like I said, just like we're in that situation where we don't know exactly what the hospital is going to do, not do what they're going to change on their own or not observe or inject something brand new, the MOC is sort of in the same place. So it's, it's possible to do that, but we've always kind of questioned the benefit. Unless it's an inject that's triggered by the MOC where the MOC says this event has just happened, calling everyone's attention that's participating in the drill to focus on either a new activity, a new process, a new procedure, or a new workflow. Um, it's difficult to go out and do that. But I will share with you that even the hospitals within the hospital systems, and I'm not saying this in a derogatory way, it was observed through many of the hospital systems that they themselves were not tracking within the exercise and they weren't themselves sure what was happening from facility to facility, which was interesting, especially since they are trying to participate from a facility basis and at least be organized within their own business unit, if you will. Not saying that's a bad thing. It was just an observation that they all made on their own. Um, they weren't tracking themselves within the event. Their command centers weren't necessarily getting status updates on what was happening as the series of events was unfolding and as the calendar was actually being observed. So everybody universally seemed to make that observation. The MOC did, the separate hospitals and facilities did, we did as volunteers supporting both of those groups or all of those groups. Um, that was not a unique thing. And this isn't the first time that we've heard that. The um, the other item that was in there was that there was a lot of traffic that I don't think a lot of folks heard or knew about. I don't know whether or not we had a lot of people that were watching Web EOC as an example, but I was sort of sitting off to the side the day of the event um, 
looking at what was happening within my organization specifically. I was also looking at what Sharp was doing. I was also looking at what the county was doing. <laughs> and I was also looking at what another ancillary group that was involved kind of off to the side was doing. So I had four different computers running different sessions of web eoc plus trying to listen to what was happening on the air via the repeaters and keep track of what was going on so i had a busy morning and we've done this before at the moc i think we need to get back to more of a standardized rigor on staffing the moc and i know that this was a particular challenge kind of as the first event that we've had with this kind of participation since we really had our COVID event. But um, it was normal for us to staff the MOC with three, four, five, six, seven people, just depending on what we were doing. That way we had runners in the room. We actually had observers that were in the incident command center. We had folks that were bridging the message running between the groups that were trying to send messages or injects to us and through our group. Uh, we had people on multiple repeaters and radios at all times. So if somebody missed something, someone else that was listening to that same repeater could go out and ship in, pick up, carry on, and in some cases monitor a secondary repeater or secondary system. So I'm, I'm thinking that we want to try to do that, again, with the luxury of volunteers, to be sure, which was a little stressed for this event as well. We know that. But... Um, it was a really good comeback after the hiatus, is my opinion. In doing the debriefing at the MOC, Marty and company there did not know that I was on the big screen in the background, which was fun. So I got to listen to Marty go out and do his report, and I chipped in right afterwards. In fact, I was watching the folks at the MOC smiling because when Marty was wrapping up, I had my hand up in the air and they were all chuckling in the background. I didn't mention that the other form of communication that I was doing in the background was I was sending and receiving all kinds of text messages to folks at the MOC and at some of the sites. So I had that many things that I was juggling. And believe me, I think that in a real event, we're going to be doing all that stuff. We're going to be in Web EOC if the Internet's up and we've got connectivity to the Internet. We're going to be on the air in multiple different fashions via RF. We are absolutely, if our phones and cellular systems are working, going to be literally on the phone. We are literally going to be in text messaging. We might be in some other messaging apps as well, depending on what the event is. All of these things are threaded back to how many people can you go out and have at an incident command center. So that's going to be, again, I think a, a reoccurring thing and something that we can improve on pretty easily. For the next event um with all sincerity we had compliments flowing out of the moc again not just for the folks that were there but for the rest of the support for the event we had um compliments coming out of my organization specifically we sort of did a light very light debrief this week we've got our actual work to go out and get our final reporting done by the end of the month so probably by next meeting i can report out from my institution on what the event was like for them in greater detail and depth. And that way you can hear it from a hospital perspective. But um, otherwise, I think we were in good shape. We did good, we did really well, extremely well, again, coming out of the hiatus where we hadn't been doing this. I think uh, we might've had some challenges with the repeater systems a little bit, but not any more than normal. We had some sites, as Rob mentioned, that were a little challenged getting in or out of some of the machines. And again, not anything that's unusual. Um, shy of that, I think it went well. And what I really appreciated for this was that when Rob was showing the pictures that everyone was as well attired professionally as they were. It's exactly what we want to go out and see. We want to make sure that we've got Folks that are out there looking at least business casual, if not better, we want to make sure that we are, you know, showing up at a site. We are presenting to them as if we are augmenting their staff and we're doing it professionally. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're not just uh, running around and doing things like we're at the beach and it's beach weather and we're hanging out underneath an umbrella. That's kind of not what we want to do. That's not the way to go. The... Um, the words of wisdom I want to talk to you about 
and in regard to the site folks that are running the site that have been assigned, I'm going to hold, but what I want to do now is invite folks, unless Rob has any additional feedback at this point, I want to invite folks that participated in the event. If you want to go out and do a live debrief and summary, I know not everyone was probably following on the email threads where they were put in, but let's open it up for um, folks that want to go out and report what happened and allow it to be interactive where we can have other folks ask questions as we go. Raise your hand uh, electronically if you could, we'll, we'll call on you. Nobody wants to share? Huh. One of the most amazing things about being an amateur radio operator, and I've noticed this, we do so well on the air. We're so fluent, proficient, smooth, and yet you get into a meeting forum. <laughs> it's just Zoom, folks. It's just Zoom. You're not even in the room with anybody. Hey, you do. Chris, there is one hand up there, David uh, K and six W N N. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. This was my first time participating in um, any event. And uh, I wanted to say thank you and um, thank you to Kevin. Um, it was a great event. It, it was uh, it was all good, other than finding the initial spot. Um, that was a little bit of a challenge, but once we got over that hurdle, it was all good. David, you were at the Radio Children's. Yes. Okay. Bruce, we got uh, Stephen, KC6MIE, uh, with a comment. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I was one of the net controls for the HF portion, along with uh, Brian in Northern California, uh, Craig down in South Bay, and uh, Dennis, WS6DQ. And we had uh, a fair amount of check-ins, and I uh, appreciate the help from Northern California. And the signals were good. The propagation uh, was with us that day. So anyway, I thought it was uh, from the HF standpoint, I thought it was a, a good success. Stephen, thanks for running that note. You were in two different bands, correct? Uh, two, yes, 80 and 40. Additional comments, thoughts, suggestions for next time? Uh, Roger had his hand up, but I'm not sure what happened. Well, he's clapping now. But... Oh, that's Roger <laughs> clapping. Okay, got it. All Thank right. you, Roger. Okay, yes, this was my first time as well. I had the scripts green, a little challenge to find the, the area. On the west side of the hospital, it was very challenging to get a connection to uh, um to the repeater and so thank god that cwp brought up a 20-foot push-up mass with an antenna that we were able to connect above and beyond the hospital but uh sometimes line of sight is always a challenge but uh other than that i brought my handheld it didn't do too well so we end up using their radios uh, uh hooked up to the antenna and of course the challenging of the uh hospital form was different to what we had in the system. So I think that you brought you brought that to the table as well. So other than that, uh, for my first event, it was very, very um, interesting. Uh, learning the ropes of the, uh, the hospital comp plan. And from then on in, um, I am uh, very active in, in getting my task book signed off. I got a couple more line items, the UHF, EHF one link, I got to get set up, got the, got the equipment and stuff, just get it programmed and set it up. As you know, I got the one lake HF all ready to go as I think Patrick received a message from me once upon a time. And I think Marty did too. Uh, other than that, uh, I got the ISO, I think the ISO, the ISC 100 tasks to uh, get done. And then I'll be uh, signed off on my uh, team member. So it's a pleasure and I'm looking forward to do more. 
Anyway, that's me, W6CVA. Back to the group. Roger, thank you for those comments. Uh, Patrick, uh, I see your hand up. Take it away. Okay, very good. Well, uh, to uh, follow up with what Roger said, I think one of the other problems we have, for some reason, depending on the time of year, we have what is, you know, the typical coastal ducting. And we do get some mutual interference from, you know, stations outside the area. Uh, the other thing is the fact that uh, it, it, as Roger's indicated, it can be challenging trying to get a signal out. And a majority of the message that may have been sent out by uh, Stephen, you know, KC6MIE and others, the messages start coming in when I was about three quarters of the way home, which I found rather interesting. Uh, we were able to get some messages out. And there's the other problem we had was a difficulty in the hospital status report that was much different than the one that they uh, utilized. However, uh, that hospital status report is one that we got from uh, one of the hospital groups to begin with, and I thought that it was being shared uh, uh, throughout the uh, MOC area, but perhaps not. Uh, but nonetheless, I think we did quite well, and I appreciate that uh, that uh, Austin and uh, Steve who went to the meeting to make sure that uh, we uh, we were had a presence there, and at the same time, we got a chance to see uh, some of the difficulties that we were having when it comes to interacting with message types. So I'm sure that will be rectified in the future, but it was uh, one of those uh, come to realization moments that uh, not everything works as expected. So thank you very much. Back to you. Patrick, thank you. Great comments. Any other first timers? Oh, Frank's Frank, Frank, Tank, Frank, tell us about the MOC and your experience. Oh, yes. Uh, I was going to ask Marty to give us an introduction to the MOC. I was sort of the backup operator. So I did have voice and wind link backup capability. So I relieved Kevin occasionally on voice. Uh, and so that was good. Although in the beginning, we were isolated from the MOC, actually the people working. So if I go there next time, I want to get in on the debrief or the briefing in the beginning. So I know more about who to contact to get the inside information as far as what's happening on the timeline. Because I felt uh, it, we weren't. I think we had to have a badge to get in to do it officially. And because we were short staffed, they volunteered and gave us a runner. And he had family radios operating on channel one. So I was gonna comment during a real emergency, family radio or GRMS on channel one is gonna be extremely busy and unusable most likely. So that might be a note. Uh, and so that might be a good thing for us to do is to have backup family radios that you could hand to the staff if you have to remotely operate outside because our our setup was outside and uh, of course the uh, staff was inside on the higher level there. Uh, so those are the key the second floor, third floor of the building. Yeah. Was it second floor? I think. Yeah. And the elevator had a lock on it. So you had to have a badge to get through the elevator, <laughs> but they had great food. So that was nice. Yeah. yeah Maybe I over to Marty. For... Tell us more about the MOC. I apologize for not being there uh, this time, but my back was uh, not in good enough shape to make it. Um, there, the, the last time when we did it, uh, I was on Web EOC as well, uh, seeing what's going on, and there, there just weren't a lot of events to really put out and uh, advertise to everybody that this is what's going on. Um, trying to monitor all of that and then uh, doing running up and down stairs or through the elevator is uh, uh, kind of time consuming as well. But um, hopefully they'll be in a more permanent position where we can get radios in the room 
and be a lot closer. I don't know what the uh, time schedule for that is, but uh, uh, that would be good. That would help things out a lot uh, to be a lot closer to uh, the people in the MOC. Uh, would definitely make things a lot easier. And the uh, hospital situation form, they changed that just, just very, very recently. And I thought we had the latest forms and uh, uh, I, I have a feeling we probably had the latest forms and some of the hospitals are a little behind in catching up <clears throat> with, uh, with some of the forms. But uh, at least that's what it appeared to be after looking back on things that, uh, that I could see. Thanks, Rob. Dave, thanks for that. Uh, Marty, tell us about the MOC. Yeah, so uh, I, th I thought the uh, MOC staff was uh, a really a phenomenal. They uh, welcomed us both uh, at the beginning and uh, the uh, debrief uh, after the uh, event. And so I thought uh, they uh, singled us out by basically saying, um, well, uh, we've been working with uh, Aries and HEM operators for the last uh, 20 years. And uh, we, we didn't at first really appreciate what uh, Aries and HEM radio can do for us until they actually face the power outage and uh, some of their uh, uh, internal uh, systems uh, went down. And so they really singled us out as somebody uh, who can really make a, make a big impact and a, a difference there. Uh, as far as the uh, drill was concerned, uh, I think the code, a co-location of the uh, Aries MOC with the MOC would definitely uh, uh, improve the uh, immediacy of uh, communication between uh, two groups. I think the uh, having a runner and having a, a, a MOC being uh, in, in a place that is difficult to access definitely did not uh, help. But also uh, since we did have uh, family radios, I felt uh, MOC, like the information was uh, not as quickly and comprehensively disseminated, probably because there's a lot of conflicting and uh, uh, um, uh, more urgent messages that uh, MOC uh, was handling. Uh, I think um, uh, the, the really positive that I saw came out of uh, the event is that uh, several people actually called us on the family radio to see if they could come down and take pictures of our uh, ham radio setups and uh, stations uh, because they're seriously considering uh, setting up a, a radio room even though it, it, it's only a temporary uh, leased uh, location where they are uh, uh, currently. So, so I, I, I kind of felt uh, that there was uh, a lot of uh, common ground that we could be working on to uh, make things uh, happen uh, more, more smoothly. Uh, I think uh, I felt with a WinLink, uh, I didn't see uh, this, the challenges that uh, some of us had previously. I, I felt that was going on, that, that traffic was good. Uh, I think we only resorted to one uh, gateway uh, that we primarily use. Uh, but one uh, issue uh, that I could foresee is if that one or two gateways, uh, if they stop working or are getting overloaded, uh, there's no good alternative other than moving the station around the building to, uh, uh, to be able to access some of the uh, northern uh, gateways. Again, if the antenna is in the on a building uh, that would probably uh, mitigate those uh, issues. I think, and uh, maybe Kevin uh, can, can comment on that, but I felt the, uh, 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 as far as the uh, voice communication repeater operations uh, uh, went, uh, I think uh, that went exceptionally well. And uh, Kevin did a phenomenal job in as, as pretty much uh, the, the key uh, operator backed up by, by Frank. Uh, to keep a uh, traffic going and uh, get the information uh, uh, across. So, so overall, I felt uh, uh, we definitely could have uh, been in the same building uh, that would have improved things and uh, definitely having ha had more uh, folks that, uh, especially on the voice side, would have uh, dramatically uh, helped some of the uh, immediacy of the uh, uh, operation. Marty, thank you. Good. Kevin, anything you to add? 
a quick comment on uh, Winlink. Uh, we were, I was running on the 430 band for Winlink simultaneously while Marty was on the two meter band with Winlink. So that, that worked out really well. We didn't interfere with each other. I had excellent Vera wide band uh, link with Meneers set up to the north. And uh, occasionally I'd check in with the two meter Red Cross uh, wind link. And so I had multiple access points for wind link. That worked out well. Frank, thank you. Kevin, Kevin, MOC Kevin. Uh, so uh, most of my concerns, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so most of my concerns have already been expressed um, in your presentation, but um, compared to our last exercise at that location, uh, being shorthanded did hurt us. However, kind of contrary to that, the last time I was a one-armed one -armed paper hanger when it came to voice communications, and um, Judy and I uh, were really swamped. And this time around, we didn't have a lot of voice communications in and out of the MOC. Uh, I'm not sure why what the difference is there um just something something of note um reflecting on that the fact i i expected a lot more voice activity given my one one and only previous experience there um i stayed on on the air all the time and uh, well backed up by frank anticipating a lot more traffic um but in retrospect um probably could have um, myself or Frank, either one, uh, spent more time in the MOC, physically in the building, uh, because we were figuratively in the dark as to what was transpiring in the field. Um, I don't have web EOC access, but after hearing from Dave, I'm not sure that would have it would have mattered. <laughs> um, but, but that's why uh, everybody else on this call did not hear any situation reports from from us um, because we didn't know what was going on. Um, I think uh, Marty was in a better position to know because he, you know, there was a lot more wind link traffic than there was voice in and out of the MOC. Um, so, like I said, the, that concern, you know, not being it physically embedded with the MOC so that we we would have a better situational awareness um, hinders us in our ability to support um, the hospitals at, at large. Um, so we need to overcome that. And of course, you know, the hospital um, status report form that everybody complains about. Um, I anticipated that because I saw that the last time as well. Um, and I, I think we just, we should push to get that resolved or standardized, but at the same time, the service we provide, we need to be flexible. We need to be able to work around that uh, and just understand that thing, things are not going to go as we think they are um, in the field. Uh, yeah, those are my comments. Thanks. Excellent points. Uh, thanks, Kevin. And yeah, got to be flexible with the forms. They're not always going to line up perfectly. That's great. Let, let's switch over to uh, Steve. You've had your hand up for a while. So take it away, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Well, many of us, uh, as was mentioned, you know, had uh, challenges because of uh, changes in staff at the hospitals. Uh, I was the lead over at the Scripps Green and um, <clears throat> ended up finally getting contact with someone at the Scripps uh, corporate, Leisha, uh, who was uh, helpful in getting me in contact with the uh, <clears throat> folks uh, directly over at Green. And then um, Lisa actually came over to serve as facilitator for the hospital command center and serve as the incident commander there. Uh, <clears throat> what I learned from her was that she came to Scripps from uh, Palomar uh, Medical Center. And so she was well familiar with Aries and the radio group over uh, there and uh, asked about them. And so I just wanna give a shout out to the regulars that uh, staffed over there because uh, it created a very positive image. She was well aware of what Aries is and what we do and uh, was very uh, receptive and uh, welcoming for our participation um, over at the Scripps Green. So <clears throat> thanks to the uh, positive role of uh, everyone uh, working over at the Palomar facility. 
Steve, thanks. It's always nice when a member of the public or a member of the staff walks up and instead of asking, who are you or what are you doing? They might ask, which band are you on? Ooh, that's, <laughs> that, that's a good thing. Hey, uh, let's, uh, Mike, K6AMQ, your comments. Hey, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, first of all, thank uh, Valley Center. If you've ever been to Mike and Rhonda's in Holland, they have their trailer stored and we have to haul that thing down to Palomar. It's no easy task. Uh, that's a long, long haul and um, hooking that trailer up and everything, but they've uh, been faithful doing that. And I think Palomar realizes that in a real emergency, that, that trailer will probably not be available to be doing other things. So I think they're gearing up towards <clears throat> that. <laughs> Evidence, you know, evidence that that's maybe the situation at some future date. Um, also, I wanted to uh, uh, find out from Jay. They, I know we're going to have some training. Uh, I guess it was August. I think you've scheduled it for the uh, for Palomar to actually host that event. Uh, when you're talking to them, are you working with uh, one of the? Uh, uh, I'm not sure who you're working with on that. But are they uh, intending to get their own staff that staff the hospital for emergencies? Is he getting that idea from them? Well, I'm not sure. We, we had a long talk last week, uh, this past week, and uh, yes, they are going to uh, host the uh, August 26th class, which is good. I think that given what they've told me of the facility, I think that's good. I've got to, I'm going to go up and eyeball it just to make sure. And at that point, it'll be uh, <clears throat> books and, uh, and the like. I've been talking to uh, Brian and Brent. Uh, I don't, I, the names are in the other, in the class context. So Brian Stroud and Brent, I forget his last name. Uh, the director was not on the, on the call that we had, but uh, they, they are getting lots of equipment. Um, you know, they're getting an FTDX uh, something and uh, uh, several uh, handhelds for staff to take home. And they really want to get their folks uh, licensed. So they are, are motivated. Uh, good job, uh, folks there getting, getting the hospital uh, engaged. Um, and, uh, you know, they're going to get, a, like I said, a couple of dual banders and an HF radio. So, so they're, they're into it. They're, their folks are, uh, are, are going for it. Any other specific question you had about them? Oh, that's, I think you answered it, uh, pretty well. I know you're working with those two and that's, those are the ones I've been working with too. So that's good. So uh, yeah, they're, uh, they'd ask for us some recommendations on some radios and stuff. And at this point, uh, there wasn't much we could give to them. We were probably more concentrating and getting some antennas on the roof in a permanent manner. Yeah, they said uh, they were going to get a room on like the ninth floor, probably for easier access to the roof or something. And they uh, they spoke highly of you and your uh, your team's uh, um, uh, participation in their uh, endeavors. Yeah, yeah, we're actually looking at the tenth floor. <laughs> actually, be the a room uh, be on the tenth floor roof. Okay. Uh, so that that's what we're looking at and. Uh, that's two floors above where we ran the antenna this last time. Right. And I, I got to say that the, just so everybody knows, I mean, the, the staff uh, uh, there that we've worked with, they, they're two of them are ham radio operators and it's probably the most engaged uh, we've had with people knowing what the heck we're doing. Uh, even though Alicia was very good in the past, she, it was an education process to bring her up to speed of what, what we do. So that's all I had. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jay. Jay, anything further? Um, no, that's, uh, you know, at home doing uh, net control backup was, uh, it was interesting. I, the only observation I would make about that is that um, um, we had uh, net controls uh, north, uh, south, uh, west, you know, et cetera. And I think that was uh, an interesting choice because if we did have repeater or power failures and we had to do simplex, uh, we probably would need to, uh, um, operate in that that manner which is sort of a sort of an eye opener for me why do we need so many net controls oh well what if the repeaters aren't aren't working so good uh and that was the only the only thing that i noticed in the comp plan or one of the things i noticed in the comp plan that was uh interesting to me jay which were your uh, go-to repeaters as a backup net control um i i picked sharp because it was centrally located but that was before we knew that they kind of wanted to do the comms there so i took a lot of position reports over that um I found the Cora, the Cora Woodson uh, busy this drill and last. Um, and let me see if I don't you did use Cora. I I tried, but every time I went over there, they were busy. 
there was something they were chattering they were chatting so uh the other ones i used i will have to pull the paperwork and get back to you in a minute uh and um let somebody else talk while i do that okay hey fred if you still get your headset on uh, which repeaters did you use uh, mostly so bars uh yeah i was uh monitoring uh primary net control but uh primarily so bars because i know uh, mark was having a tough time so it's kind of the intermediary if i could talk to him and then pass traffic uh on the primary net uh i was doing so and like you said earlier he was the lone ranger there at the uh at the hospital and the, where he was is not ideal and I've got a couple of people to call and follow up on that to try to get a better location. There's, I think there's a different radio room set up now, or at least some sort of EOC at that hospital. Did you use any other repeaters? Um, let's see. So bars, I did, I did try to see if anybody was on our newly acquired, uh, Ciro Coronado repeater that wasn't used. And, uh, uh i tried a little bit of simplex with mark trying to see if uh, just plain old simplex 146.445 was was workable and it was not and then looking at the picture that he sent and where he was inside with a big thick glass and all of that it's it's even it's amazing that he even got any traffic out at all yeah. and then many thanks to sobars uh, for picking up the coronado radio assets uh, with uh, the Coronel Club uh, folding. Uh, so thank you for, for picking up that and working through uh, the uh, frequency coordinator for Southern California and, and, and all that administrative stuff. Yeah, that uh, that's, should be the, the official changeover, which is just purely administrative, you know, on the part of TASMA. That should be uh, done by July, July the 8th, I think their next uh, technical committee and Hopefully, you know, they'll bless it there. We got preliminary indications that everything is is in order. So it's just a matter of uh, formality at this point. Excellent. Excellent. Let's Rob, switch back to Jay. Yeah, I used a four, 14, uh, and I think 11 and 13. Those are the ones that are prominent in my radio. Could you uh, remember which ones they were? The names? I do not. Okay, I'll look them up later. Thanks. Okay, sorry. We'll, we'll make sure we get those for uh, the next exercise. And yeah. if anybody has any repeaters in mind for future exercises that were not in the comp plan on the 15, let me know and we will uh, get those added in later. Additional uh, comments about the, the exercise. We'll, we'll talk about other stuff uh, coming up in a few minutes here. Uh, and I see David would like questions uh, after everything else is done. And uh, other comments about the hospital exercise. Okay, Bruce, back to you. Okay, so I did not write anything down. I'm gonna think, uh, I think I got most of the critical points that I wanna hit back on. So I'll cover them and we can talk as we go. Related to the MOC first. Um, the MOC was, as mentioned, in a temporary location. Turns out that, as we've learned just this year, temporary for them probably means three to five years. They were actually unsure, uh, even as far as late last year, whether or not they were going to be in that location through this year. Um, turns out they are. Turns out they will be. And now they're talking three to five years. So the game plan for the MOC is to go out and get it reorchestrated, much like we had in Grantville. There will be a dedicated radio room. They are working with the landlord and building management on making sure that they can go out and run coax from that side of the building up to the roof. We've been talking with them related to um, non-penetrating roof mounts so they don't have to go out and worry the landlord any more than the landlord might already be worried about doing things. So all of those things are in motion. I don't know that they will be done by fall of this year because it's not just up to that building, that building management, but it'll also be up to County of San Diego and having to work with their radio resources folks to go out and get things bought, purchased, and put in. Um, so my expectation for November is that we will probably and most likely be doing it a la carte 
and outside of the building again. But we'll see. Um, common thread for them as well as other facilities. If folks are asking for radio recommendations, uh, and I'm not trying to say that we did anything wrong, because I don't think anybody did anything wrong. But when it comes to the radio recommendations and what we're trying to standardize on, this is kind of like going to what used to be ham radio outlet on any Saturday when there's free donuts hanging around and people asking, well, what kind of radio should I buy? Because I'm going to be doing this. You know, it's the it's the old adage where you're going to go out and ask a million people and they're going to get 10 million answers. It's just the way it's going to be. If you get a request for recommendations on gear and equipment, things like that, please relay those back to Dave and myself and have Dave and myself get in contact with the folks that are asking. We've been working a number of years on trying to standardize what that radio lineup would look like. And yes, we know that there are currency issues, models will change, things will you know, eventually become extinct and no longer available for sale. And we know things will surplace them, but Dave and I have been working on standardized lists for a number of years now and making those recommendations. And part of that is to be, Part of that is to be certainly to our benefit because we will be able to standardize on what we think as a common body of knowledge our operators should be expecting to run into in the field. So that's part of the benefit in doing that. Um, radio comms in general, uh, there were some challenging locations and machines and repeaters. One of the um, one of the research items that we used to go out and do beforehand was go out and pre-run a site. I honestly don't know whether we had time this event with the changing calendars and people and assignments and things like that. If folks actually did go out and pre-run the site to verify what machines they could get into reliably and just kind of check on things in general. But we always recommend that. And what I had actually asked Rob to do when he was setting up the assignments for this particular event we wanted to make sure that we were going appropriately to each location. So if you were at a site, theoretically, you were there with at least a mobile radio, 25 or more watts, probably a decent um, antenna that wasn't a mag mount, but who knows? I don't know exactly what was put out there, but effectively higher power than just a handheld and maybe a small antenna. We knew that was going to be problematic. We wanted to make sure that we weren't going to be in any weird scenario. So it was really a request to go out and make sure that any staffing that was done, big radio, hopefully better than average antennas, things like that. Um, noting that it's kind of hard to get into some of the machines because there are things like ducting and whatnot. I'm going to say that that's a reoccurring theme as well. And what I'm going to suggest is that may not quite be what you think ducting is, especially for the locations that are along the coast. And I'm thinking green in general. I'm thinking UCSD sometimes, um, sometimes La Jolla. But uh, even up to some of the coastal facilities that we used to go out and take care of in North County, a lot of times the... Um, the challenge in getting into the machine isn't so much that it's ducting or anything else. It's really multipath and having multipath related problems. And what I had been doing a couple of years ago before we hit COVID was I was actually tinkering at my sites using an omnidirectional antenna first, decent one outdoor, um, like you'd use it at your home, but not, you know, a super long or big one. So something, you know, six to seven dB of gain on on VHF on two meters and, you know, maybe eight to 10, eight to 11 dB of gain on 440. And comparing that with a very small Yagi antenna, four element, four element, literally on two meters, not very big antenna. And also using small four to seven element on 432. And it was a very dramatic difference. It wasn't so much the little bit extra gain, you know, four element, two meter Yagi antenna, probably in the neighborhood of about 10, 10 and a half dB a gain. So a little bit better than a vertical is going to be, but having the ability to actually point it either directly at the repeater site to get rid of the multipath or 
pointed at something that's going to give you the right bounce if you can't see the repeater site correctly seem to be the better answer. Um, and if you're out there shopping on the internet, you're looking around carefully and doing things, you could probably buy one of each for under a hundred bucks and have that available effectively in your go kit or toolkit. But we'll talk more about that in a future meeting. Um, the common notes about being indoors like Mark was at, anytime that you're in one of these newer energy efficient buildings and you've got any kind of glass that looks like it's got a funky tint on it for solar reasons and to go out and keep heating the building down and preserve energy costs and all that fun stuff, you know, you may as well almost be in a Faraday cage. It's a bad thing, but We've noticed that at a number of sites, and whenever we have that, we have to go out and do placement outside. As an example, our current corporate building from my facility, there's a normal place where we work out of on the second floor, and it's old solar glass, really old, probably 20 years. And it's enough that it attenuates the signal. It doesn't really help that we're down on the side of a hill kind of dipping into a valley either, but it really hard, it's really hard to hit Otai from inside the building. The second I go out and pop a mag mount out on the metal rail that's on a little balcony on that same second floor, signals up about five to 10 dB. So it makes a heck of a difference. I totally get that problem. If you're ever gonna be put into an indoor scenario, then that's something that is good, bad, or otherwise we should be prepared to deal with. Even if it means that you got to a foot stop or a door stop in the door and you've got your coax running out the crack and you've got it taped to the ground and whatever else, all with permission of the facility and their safety manager and or incident command staff, of course, I would be you know ready for those scenarios too. We've had to do those in the past, even at the MOC. Um, I don't really have anything else related to the drill. I think the debrief was good. What I really wanna make sure of though, is from a leadership perspective, if you're the point person at a site, this is where the ARIES training, the ICS related training, your stuff that you've been working on since we really started digging into the, the training regime five, six, seven, eight years ago now. Um, the person that's in point in control on lead should be fully in control of the event for the site. You're responsible. If you have any reason, safety or any other functional reason why someone shouldn't be there, even if they've been assigned, the leaders for the sites have the right to politely let the person know that might be in conflict for whatever reason that um, we're doing okay here, where we've got enough staff, et cetera, whatever the reason is. Um, we're going to let you go, cut you loose and, you know, carry on about your day. You have full discretion to be able to do that. You do not, as a site leader, have any responsibility or obligation to take on people that showed up on their own, voluntarily, or without being assigned. And in fact, I would completely discourage that. If we're treating this like it's a real event and what we continue to try to train for from a logistics perspective and staffing perspective, we need to know where all of our folks are at. We need to know where our assets are at, human and otherwise. And we don't want to be in a position of liability or have a problem where someone might be in danger or in an unsafe scenario or in a situation where as a site leader, you don't have command and control of the people that we have assigned there. So if you have spontaneous volunteers, people showing up that shouldn't be there, people that weren't assigned, and especially the ones that might be very casual observers that might have come in from a day at the beach that just wanted to show up, you have every right to go out and send them politely home. Thank them very much. Let them know that we would love to have them for a future event. And if they meet all the qualifying requirements and criteria, uh, I just don't want to have anybody out there have any question about that, that the site leader or have any qualms about that because that's the way we should be operating. Shy of that, I don't have any additional traffic other than we are looking forward tentatively to having our first in-person meeting potentially in the month of September. 
still working on details. We will probably know by the late July timeframe, early August. That is all.